Cheers guys, Epix911. Gonna do something a little different because of the uh, time constraints I've been under the last few weeks and for the next few weeks. I've been just absolutely terrible on reading comments, answering questions. So I thought I'd do a Q&A video. Unlike the time commitments that I've completely failed on, like the web forums and timeless gamers, this is something I can do. Uh, so I rifled through, grabbed some questions, and gonna answer them. Let's start with question one. This one is from Al Martin and he asks, I'd like your opinion, Epics. Do you think that foveated rendering technology, eye tracking, will add extra processing info to the incoming wireless hardware or just the other way around? Now, I'm not an expert. I understand the basics. I've done game programming and programming in the past. My understanding of how it currently works is head position is calculated. That data is then sent, wired wirelessly, however, the screen is then rendered and the process kind of repeats. Uh, some data probably sent back, etc. With the foveated rendering and the eye tracking, there's just that extra little bit inserted, but the brute force takes place on the HMD. The data being sent back and forth just includes that additional positional information. So you're going to have head position, eye position, calculation, send data, render screen. And just that added little bit, I don't think is going to significantly add to the overhead. So feel free to correct me if there's anybody out there who's more of an expert on that. Uh, again, I am not, but again, my basic understanding of how it works. Question two, Matt G. Oprize LP asks, how will spectators or video capture work with eye tracked foveated rendering. Can't watch a video with most of it blurry except for where someone else is looking. And my guess is that it's probably going to be similar to Robinson the Journey. So that uses foveated rendering and the spectators, they see that same blurriness on the perimeter. The blurriness made up because X number of pixels every second or third, whatever, is omitted. What I think is going to happen with the eye tracking is the spectator is only going to see the HMD positional information, that render. So if you're looking straight ahead, you're moving your eye like this, the spectator's probably just going to see your straight on view. They're not going to see the rendering as a result of your eyes moving. At least that's my guess. Maybe they will, but that I can see as a way of getting around that. And that's my guess is that's probably what they're going to do. Question number three, Daniel Fritz asks, Epics, just got a VR ready phone. What should I be playing or watching? Well, on the watching front, Netflix. Absolutely. The reason and probably the biggest feature with the tethered units, you got a lot of bulk. With the Gear VR, it's pretty damn light and you can lay down and the strap doesn't dig into the back of your head. It's comfortable, especially if you're laying on a pillow. And the beauty of that is you can then watch Netflix on the ceiling. It's like having your own private, massive, big screen TV mounted in your ceiling. Super comfortable, doesn't strain the neck, and so comfortable, in fact, I've fallen asleep multiple times doing that, but it works well. Game-wise, Land's End, Minecraft, and of course, Oculus Arcade, one of my favorite, uh, about 20 games in that. There's some others. But those are the ones that, that I've enjoyed uh, on Gear VR. If there's anybody else out there who has a Gear VR, feel free to chime in on the comments. Question number four. Cyrus Jones asks, why did you do a story on that basic electric impulse haptics feedback when I sent you the website on a different group doing the same thing, but much more and miles ahead? And then he includes the link for the Tesla suit dot io url simply cyrus like i was saying in the reason for this video i just haven't had the time didn't even read your comment missed it completely if i had i probably would have included it i tend to do that and then mention the viewer that posted it simple answer again just missed it but with that said it's a cool link i definitely like the story and i'll try to include that either tonight or in a future episode, it's not really time-sensitive news, uh, but it is a cool story. 
Question five, Andy Sky, what if every AAA game developer brings VR through DLC? For example, Battlefield 1, have a VR patch DLC for $9.99. We could see big titles from all kinds of publishers, uh, de developers that are AAA, UB, Square Enix, Activision, EA, Konami, Bethesda. Well, probably not Konami with their new model, but all the other ones. I think that's a fantastic idea. If they were more like the Batman Arkham, showcase the game, be tight, but not super lengthy. It would cut down on their costs. They could probably justify it, uh, unlike a full game. We'd have access to AAA content, even if it wasn't the full game, but enough to tie us over until the install base is large enough for them to do full games. I love that idea, Andy. I think that's terrific. We're seeing that with some publishers. It would be nice to see that with a lot more. And sorry, guys, losing my voice here as I go to the next one. Question six, Tom Smith asks, what HMD is best for sim racing games? Well, I'm going to give you my subjective answer. My three favorite cockpit racing games for VR, Dirt Rally, Project Cars, and Assetto. Of those, unfortunately, Dirt Rally currently, even though you can use Revive, it's really only properly supported on the Rift. So for me, the Rift just for that reason. Plus, yeah, it's a little bit more comfortable than the Vive to wear. Uh, even though I love my Vive, I'd probably go with the Rift specifically for that question, racing games, because those three titles, I love them. Question seven, Daniel Fritz asks, just out of curiosity, why do you say Betamax was better than VHS? I thought they were the same. Uh, it was a stepping stone to the next technology. Do you think we'd be any more advanced now if we went Betamax? So the answer to that simply, and there's a few of them for why Betamax was better, most of its history, it had the higher resolution. There's only a small window where VHS pulled even and then beta pulled ahead again. Slightly better sound. It had better color reproduction, a more stable image. Those are facts. The next one's a little bit more subjective and that's that the recorders were arguably of higher quality. So the hardware players were slightly better, but you could probably argue that point. Smaller tape size, easier to store. Uh, I remember my whole Doctor Who collection was done on Betamax. I still have it to this day in a box, even though I can't freaking play them because they were beta. And I'm sure I could find a player somewhere, but all of that Doctor Who stuff is available. Better quality now, DVD, so. Question eight. Daniel Fritz again asks, uh, with the move, is there anything with the new man cave you will change, maybe do different this time to make it more efficient? Absolutely. Permanent green screen, without a doubt. So I'm going to have a corner of the man cave that's permanently green screened, both walls, floor, and ceiling. So it'll give me more green screen space because currently I'm always, I always have to be aware of how much I move left or right or forward and back uh, or body parts start disappearing, right? I go headless or legless or armless, whichever. So green screen and then a more permanent solution for my tracking. So my... Uh, lighthouses and the Rift cameras, probably going to either wall mount, ceiling mount, or monopod them, but it's going to be a much more permanent solution. Question nine, whatever happened to Final Fantasy VR? Good question. In fact, I'd heard so little I'd forgotten completely about it. Did some research, found an article from Destructoid from February of this year, and they asked director Hajime Tabata the same question, and his answer was short, but it was that development is progressing. And that's it. So take from that what you will. They're still working on it. Absolutely no timeline. Question 10, Say Moi asks, story behind yours and Exidy's nicknames. Absolutely. And then Fire Goat, same kind of question. He goes, uh, having my morning coffee, watching the news. Just curious, what does your name stand for or mean to you if it has a meaning at all? So yeah, let's start with my name. Epix was one of my favorite video game companies from about 1978 till 89 when they went bankrupt. They had some of the best games. They were the EA Sports of the 80s. 
Summer Games, World Games, Winter Games, uh, Javelin, Pole Vault. There are events in that. Hell, the entire game just ages well. They were able to make the animation just look so much better than any competitors. It was like night and day, literally. The animation to this day still looks amazing. Even on a computer, 8-bit like the Commodore 64, Pole Vault, Javelin, Ice Barrel Jumping in World Games. Most of those events, just as much fun now to play multiplayer as they were then. So that was what they were known for mostly. They also had some hardware. That's a whole other story. But Gateway to Apshai and Temple of Apshai, probably some of my you know favorite roguelike memories. Gateway to Apshai was my first game for my Commodore 64. I had it on a cartridge. Of course, Epics. The number comes from, and I'm sure this happens to some of you guys, you've got a cool nickname, you want to use it online, somebody's poached it. So you append a number to it. Well, that's what I did, but I just didn't want a boring number. I thought, what's going to stand out? 911 is the emergency number here in North America for ambulance, police, etc., fire. You dial 911. So I thought that would be perfect to add to the end. Exidy's name, kind of similar except the game company created arcade games, and they were also around pretty much the same period of time. No big blockbuster games. They were lesser-known titles, but they had some gems in there, some really fun games, and their name comes from their tagline. It's, uh, it's actually a portmanteau of the phrase excellence in dynamics. So you've got X in Exidy for excellence, and then D for Dynamics, Exidy. So there you go. Question 11, also from Say Moi, what VR gear does your Friday night sidekick own? That would be Exidy. None. He's had quite a few other obligations he's had to take care of first. Now he's at that point where he's close to being able to get a VR. I'm trying to steer him towards the PC. He wants to kind of go PlayStation but he really wants to play Elite Dangerous. So I'm hoping Rift or Vive. So there you go. Thanks, guys, uh, for joining me for these questions. I'll try to do this again in a few weeks. And uh, yeah, so let me know if you've got questions specifically. Just ask them in the comment section. Cheers, guys.